Okay, so yeah, I bought a bunch of, of different cameras. Um, so I've got a four by five view camera from circa 1970. I've got a four by five view camera from um, 1920. Um, address you guys too at the same time. It would be nice, huh? How about if we swing it around? And, okay. And I'll remember this on. My name is uh, so I brought a bunch of different cameras with me. Um, so it, it's been a lot of fun collecting them over the years. Uh, so some of them I just happened across and somebody needed to earn five or ten dollars, and so I got them that way. Um, that's how I got the view camera. You needed like seventy-five dollars. I said, I'll take it. So I um, that was back in 75, I think it was. But um, so there's that. The Hasselblad flex body is a little different than uh, that's the one that everybody's been taking a picture through the eyepiece and out because the, the, the front standard, uh, which is where the lens is, is stationary, other than it moves back and forth and the lens actually focuses on that. But the back standard will actually tilt. And it will rise and fall, so it's a half of a half of a view camera. And I obviously I like view cameras and I like film photography. Uh, there's also a Hasselblad 500 C back there, just to give you an idea of what the old look down through the, at your waist was all about. And uh, stereo view, stereo camera, 35 millimeter uh, Kodak uh, that's back there on the table, uh, which is a I, I yeah, I got that one, I think, from stepfather one night. Um, so, uh, yeah, my mom had three husbands, so never mind. we won't go there. But uh, not, not all at once. No, not all at <laughs> once. No, two, two didn't make it, and the third one came along and went, you realize that two of them were to die. Uh, but um, then the most recent acquisition that I have is a rolling board which is the amateur version of a Roloflex. And the Roloflex is the twin lens reflex camera. It's the one that's got two lenses top and bottom. And that was a, um, that style of camera was made very popular through uh, press photographers. They wanted to get something that was less heavy than a 10 pound speed graphic four by five that they carried you know, another 10 pounds worth of film holders and um, and flash bulbs in another pond. So it was one of the craziest. It was a great camera. You couldn't kill it. That was the nice thing about it. So uh, there's there's other formats back there. There's a, I got an English camera back there, and I have no idea what format it is. Um, I pulled out a camera this afternoon and I opened it up just to see what was going on with it, and I found a, a very defunct roll of K135. So for those of you who don't understand what that is, that's Kodachrome. Oh. And it's the Canon is probably as old as the camera itself, which is, dates from the 50s, maybe. So that's like a 70-year-old camera and, and roll of film. Uh, and the film is still inside the can, in, in the can. So I'm kind of like, do I take it somewhere and see if they can process it? Because that would be fun. Except Kodachrome hasn't been processed in 10 years. So because it's very, very environmentally unsafe. It, is, it was a nasty process. Uh, great images, though. So, okay. Um, that's, okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> I put the people on, look at that. They, did, they decided they didn't even want to watch me. They just put their names up. I know what you do. You have got a class of plan or something else. I know how this works because that's what I do. You know, when you start your presentation, sure. <laughs> so, as Ed, as Ed helps me get the presentation started, um, I have one little notes with it on this, this evening. I printed everything else so I could read it and, and know what I was going to say. And then I got about 15 minutes of the 30 minute drive to get here. And my wife calls me and she goes, Oh, by the way, did you want your friend out? It's sitting at the printer. And I was like, Uh oh. So we're going to wait. You can do this. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I don't know anything about photography. So 
Um, I could ask her to email it to you so you could write it off your phone. I have that's why it's right there on the oh, it's on the presentation. So if you see me look doing that, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, is to read my notes. Um, so the presentation as Ed is putting this together uh, is basically Cameron's hardware. That's what I really started out this presentation to be. And we, there is a section in there, by the way, that, that's called the exposure triangle. And all of the years, I have to tell you, all of the years that I've been doing photography and, and involved in it and the degree in it and everything else, I've never heard that term. So uh, never. So not that it doesn't exist, it does because they found the graphic and stuck it in. So it's a really neat graphic. Mm -hmm. So um, it is actually a triangle. Sorry. That's all right. There it is. Okay. It's not to scale. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's see. Uh, way to work today. Oh, okay. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, Patrick, you might want to remind people about the competition for March. Ah, uh, okay. So while we're getting this thing up and running, the idea for the March competition is to find a corner of or one, yeah, one corner of the exposure triangle and explore it. So the triangle has the aperture or f stops on one side, shutter speeds on the other, and down at the bottom, or where you want to put it, is the uh, ISO, or speed of the uh, sensor. So as you adjust any one of those, the other ones adjust with it. And so you've got to do this. And so the idea is pick a corner and, and try to show us in the competition what, that, what corner you chose, basically. And to see how well we can can put it together. Too far away from the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna have to control it from that screen, but it's ready. Whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you can see. You have to control it from there so they can see it. Okay, so you're gonna get to see my notes. Uh, okay. uh, so how am I gonna control it from the screen? Touch. Oh, oh, with the mouse. Oh, okay. So here it is. Doing an this way. Oh, yeah, yeah. There it is. Okay. Uh, there's something like that. Ooh, there's something there we go. And I can just use the arrow keys on this to move. It's easier. Yes, yes, you can do it. Okay. So, uh, wow. Oh, it's on a, it's on a timer. Uh oh. Brief history of photography, by the way. Um, so I they understand. I'm assuming that's all the timer because I didn't do anything. Okay, so um, there we go. Okay, early early imaging. Um, we all think that cameras were invented uh, by George Eastman and, and Brian books like that. Or, uh, what have you, but back in the 400 to 390 BCE, there was a Chinese artist who came up with the concept of the philosopher uh, that described images in a space. And so they, uh, historians think that this is probably the first um, description of what we call photography or art. Yeah. Uh, and go another hundred year, a thousand years, and eventually describes it. Uh, and that is, and let me see if I can do this. Okay, okay. So you can see Da Vinci's uh, picture on the side, and it's a man, and the focal point is behind him, and it's the uh, first description of the camera obscura. Okay, and then years later, another hundred to seventy plus years, um, we show that you could actually. Uh, it was shown that by taking a box, and instead of having a large hole, if you take a very small hole, now we call them pinhole cameras. Uh, and voila, you have the uh, what what the artists of that time used. It was felt that the the Dutch masters used the camera obscura to do a lot of their work because it was so realistic and the curves and everything else was just perfect. So uh, let's see if I can just do this. 
Can you elaborate a little bit how that camera obscura would, I, I presume they would project on the back wall? I'm yeah, I yeah. understood that. Yeah, when light rays are, are forced to converge spot, as they come in, they, they come in at an angle, and as they crisscross, they come back out, in this case, upside down and backwards. Uh -huh. And so, yes, they project on the back wall, uh, eventually, uh, in the next slide, I give up you. Patrick, let me see if I can help drive this. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this looks more like a camera that, we're, that I've got in the back. It's called a flex camera. And that is, we've got this man who is looking through a pinhole camera, but he's got a piece of ground glass that he is now looking. That's, that's what he's uh using uh the angle that's in here and coming up is the mirror and there was a ground glass here and then he put a piece of paper on top of that and then he drew on top of them he, he drew on the paper and so the ground glass gave him the image hence the, the four by fives that are back there have ground glass on in the back the flex camera has a ground glass uh, piece to it as well. And so the, the image is actually on the ground glass, and then you have another mechanism to see that image. And in the, the small two and a quarter flex camera, it is a, that's the right angle viewfinder. In the four by fives, it's your eye. You move as close as you wish, put a loop on it, and focus it, whatever you wish to do. But that's, uh, so that is the first time they used, this is the, the depiction of the first camera that an artist would have used. They had not invented film by this time in the 1760s or any kind of imaging in this place. So uh, in 1826, um, Joseph Niepce, a French uh, inventor, was the first to document actually capturing an image on some kind of substrate. And this substrate in this case was uh, what we drive on today. It was asphalt, of all things. And so uh, it took days to expose this first image. And this image, by the way, if you want to see it, in, uh, I don't know how we could, you could see it physically. Maybe we could set up something to go downtown, but it is at UT. Ransom Center. Yeah, the Ransom Center. And so they, they somehow or another, uh, managed to get it. And so, uh, but this is looking out a window, or you know, back then it, was a bit, it would have been an open window. Uh, and this this looks like a man right in this area, but it's really it's really not. It's it's just the uh, shapes and form out there. It's there are roof lines. So moving right along. Um, so that's where we start and go ahead to the next one. The evolution of cameras, as we showed, we had the pinhole camera. So, how did we get from the pinhole camera with a ground glass and a piece of paper to the Fuji? Uh, what is this XC100? I think it's called. It's a 100 megabyte uh, digital camera that came out a few months ago. So, um, so uh, over time, we had things like studio portrait cameras, and that's the uh, brown one on the uh, left hand side of the picture. That thing was massive. Um, you can see it has big steel wheels at the bottom because it probably weighed 200, 300 pounds. And it, but it was a beautiful piece of, of you know, artwork from the, uh, uh, the woodwork who made it, the cabinet maker who made it. It was a fantastic piece in that sense. It had all kinds of, uh, it, it had adjustments for the back standard actually did flex and, and tilt. Um, and there was a little bit of movement up and down, not a lot, but there was movement up and down on that as well. Um, so that was in the 1800s. 1900s is the Brownie number two sitting on the back table. That is back there. This is a different picture of, it's a different camera. I mean, it's, that's not my camera that's on the screen. But that is my brownie too that's in the back. 
So it's uh, 120 years old, and I start to play with it, and I shouldn't have. So, I, yeah, it comes, it's interesting. It comes apart in lots of different pieces. Uh, and I got it to come apart in a couple of extra that shouldn't have happened. So, yes, please. Uh, okay, so we go from uh, things like the Browning, which was a large format camera. It was actually about a 120 camera by our today's standards. Um, and then we, I, I just happen to like Hasselblads. I also like Mamiya's and Rollies. But the Hasselblad is the classic. Uh, that came out in the early 40s, and Hasselblad made it for the uh, military. I'm trying to remember which military, because they're, they're actually uh, Swedish. Uh, but it was made for the, uh, the military, uh, and then it became a commercial entity in the 50s. After, after World War II. Nikon F, this was the, uh, even though we got a lot of Canon people in here and Sony, uh, you know, people, the Nikon F was the uh, quintessential photographer or camera for any photographer that thought they were worth waiting anything. Uh, that, the top of it where it says Nikon F, that came off and there were a bunch of different viewfinders and different screens that you could put into it. There was a metering system that could be put into it. It was a very, very versatile camera. And as over time, uh, it actually auto-indexed. It had a little V thing, a V gauge on it, if you will, or a slot. Um, and as the camera, as you rotated the aperture, it actually adjusted the light meter inside to tell you what you were supposed to do with your shutter speed. So as a, you know, as modern as it was, and I, I remember some of my colleagues in the Navy using those extensively in, in the 70s. So, um, and then we get into early digital. So um, Nikon has been out there in the forefront for years and years and years. That is a picture of the Nikon D1. Came out uh, about 23 years ago. 21, 22, something like that. And it costs, uh, it was a whopping whoo, two megapixel camera. We're talking like, yes, baby. It could record seven frames a second. I mean, we're talking like, yeah, we're out there. Capture that because I was a motion picture guy. I did 16 frames on a normal day and 32 when I wanted to do something slow motion. <laughs> Even perfect. Still guys a little bit out of date. But, so that camera, uh, it's interesting, the price point of the high-end cameras hasn't changed in all those years. That is a $5,500 body back when it was introduced. This is the camera, this is the Nikon Z9 in the other picture, $5,500 body. Doesn't change much, they want $5,500 for their top-end cameras, no matter what. So, yeah. Okay, so why are we actually here tonight? We're talking about controlling light. It's the photographer's job to control the light, okay? You can turn it up, you can turn it down, but when you have a camera, you have to be, uh, you, know, you have to be considerate of what that camera is able to do. So, apertures. So an aperture, so, for those of you who are here in the room with me, this is that lens that's on the screen. And <clears throat> here, I'll start looking back around. The aperture blades are in this one, the dark one, the black one. So the aperture blades on this thing are huge. Uh, this lens that's being shown on the screen, uh, Bill is walking around with it and he's uh, holding with two hands because it weighs probably like two pounds, it's glass and steel and aluminum. And uh, it's just to show people what those aperture blades actually do. So when you have an aperture that is uh, where it's clear all the way through, at 4.8 on this lens, this is a fast lens for view cameras, 4.8. Um, the lens is wide open. Uh, on a view camera, you we get to cheat an awful lot of the standards, the front and rear standards to get in everything in focus. But when it's about half open or half closed, depending on how you look at it, it's at f11. This particular lens stops all the way down to f45. Um, and if you look, if you do a deep dive into the 
uh, history of, of classic photographers of the 30s and 40s, the Ansel Adams guys and the Edward Weston guys and gals and all those people that were doing that. They had a club, it was called the F32 Club. And you didn't shoot unless you were at F32. So you had a camera, you were on a tripod, and there was nothing handheld uh, because the films were very slow back then. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna get through. Okay, so shutter speeds. Okay, so let me go, I'm gonna back up too. Hold on. Okay, so the aperture. The aperture, if you think of it like a pipe uh, in, in a plumbing system, you have various sizes pipes. You have, let's call it a half inch, a one inch, and a, five, and a two inch pipe. And that controls how much water is going to go through. That's what an aperture does. It controls how much is going to go through in any given period of time. The shutter speeds, the shutter speeds actually determine how long you're going to leave the valve open on the pipe. That's all it is. So you got this pipe that's pushing light through or allowing light to go through, and you've got this device called the shutter that's calling it, it's cutting it off, either opening up and allowing the light to come through, or if it's, it's cutting it off and stopping it. And so how you operate the shutter will determine a lot of different things. The aperture determines a lot of things as well, but we'll, we'll get into those a little bit more. Um, okay, so the shutter, lovely picture of my granddaughter, yes. So, um, 30 pictures later, I got this one. Okay. This, if you notice the, the, the setup on the camera, you put on the right hand, or yeah, the right hand side, uh, it happens to be uh, my lens was set at 45 millimeters. Uh, it's an F16. It was a very bright, sunny day. Uh, and my uh, shutter speed was 150th of a second. The ISO, just so you know, was 164, was 64, it's because I wanted to get the, the very slow shutter speed. I, I knew, yeah, this is just pushing the system to where I want it. So in this picture, she was on her swing and she went back and she hit the apex of the swing and stopped. Click, got it. There's just a little bit of my motion in the background. My motion is, is what you see in the background where the, the trees are a little blurry. That's not her, I'm, I'm tracking with her. I know you offered a picture of a car, but this is so much more fun to look at my <laughs> So go to the next one. So, okay. So same granddaughter, same same swing. This is like three frames later. Same setup on the camera. Yeah. I'm at one fifty. Oh, yeah. Get me out at me. <laughs> okay, uh, one fiftieth of a second. I'm tracking with her. She's in reasonably good focus. She stopped because I'm going with her. The background is blurred because the background is just back there and it's, it can't, I'm not, it's not keeping up with me, the camera. And so it's all blurred. And so you can, you can do this. And there's a, another example I'll show a little bit later on. If you're doing a shutter speed at a different shutter, get a, a higher shutter speed, catching a different type of action. But this is, this is a classic. Let's track along with it and see if we can get the blur somewhere. The other thing I could have done was to hold the camera still, let her go through it and blur it, and the background would have been solid. So, okay, controller controlling the sensitivity, the sensor sensitivity. Um, this is uh, ISO is the International Standardization Organization. It's from it's out of France, I believe it is nowadays. Um, and back in 1974, they that organization. And the one in Asia and the one in the United States all got together and said, okay, we'll call it one thing. It was the ASA. Was the, we got feedback? Yeah, all of a sudden, some of these. Oh, this play. What? Excuse me. I thought I'd do it. Okay. So, um, there was ASA, which was the American Standard Association, DIM, which I'm not sure what that stood for, but I think that was out of Asia, and then ISO, which was the European 
And they all came together and they said, okay, let's just work this together. And they came up and the number is the same as what we had as an ASA. Uh, so, but now ISO is the only number used. I just had to toss that one. Uh, so, the, um, let me just make sure I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the lower the ISO, the more light you're going to need. Uh, the more light can either be an extremely bright sunny day, it can be a, a slow shutter speed with a wide open aperture. Uh, that's the classic example of, of how all of this goes together. If you have a high a, uh, ISO, you're possibly shooting something in the sports arena area. You've got motion, you want to stop it. And so the higher the, the ISO, the higher your shutter speed can go, and then your aperture fits in there wherever it's necessary to get you the best exposure. So, um, and so these are just my guesstimate. They're not any, there's nothing written in stone that says this is the way you should photograph. But um, throughout all my years of playing with cameras and everything else, um, you'll find most landscape photographers would love to shoot it at, their, at an ISO of 32 instead of 64. Um, I mean, when I shoot film, I want to get a Provia, I uh, know, sorry, Velvia 50. I just, because it, it just gives me all the uh, detail that I need. Combination of film and combination of the camera and the uh, lack, and it, it removes all the noise. Okay. At the lower uh, ASAs or ISOs, you get the least amount of noise in your image. When you're moving it up to 100 to 500, you're probably shooting uh, an event, uh, portraits, uh, flowers, maybe not flowers, but well, maybe because the wind might catch when you got to stop. Um, all kinds of different, the general photography is between 100 and 500 uh, ISO. And then when you get up above that, uh, 500 to 2000 ISO, uh, most likely sports, maybe even higher. If you've got something, uh, Bill, what, what do you shoot cars uh, out there on the track? Uh, actually, I'm shooting a lot lower because I'm you shooting want for slow shutter speed. speed. Yeah, he wants to show slow shutter speed. Okay. So, um, classic example will be uh, I, I stole the picture of uh, the Frazier Ali fight uh, way back in the 70s, like 80s, whatever it was, the fight of the century, you'll see a picture that has a high shutter speed, high, high uh, ASA at that time. And then the way they got there was they pushed the film in the development process. Okay, and then the last thing, you've got um, modern digital cameras now will do um, anywhere from 2000 on up to 32,000 up to 164,000, I think it is, or something like that. So it's uh, 100. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but if you are going to go there, test your camera out and see how much noise there is. There are, you can find stuff on Google and, and YouTube as to how to test that. Uh, but that's a, one thing you, you should always do, if you get a new camera, just go out, set it up and go through every dial and every switch, and everything on the background and, and then just play with it. Find out what they all do. Um, I, I, it's, it's a and amazing. These cameras these days are amazing, and it's cheap. The electrons are free. So, well, almost. Okay. Uh, In-camera metering. You got lots of different kinds of metering. Um, you got matrix metering, which is just the generic. We're going to make it work. We're going to, uh, the camera will meter across the entire frame. Uh, then you have central weighted which uh, there are some pictures I'll show here in just a minute. And then uh, center weighted is literally that it's in the center of the screen. It doesn't move around uh, as the spot metering will. Spot metering will allow you, in most cameras, to move that spot somewhere in the frame so that you can do it. And then uh, some cameras have highlight metering systems where they, they allow the matrix to do its job. And then you say, oh, I want just the highlights uh, exposed perfectly. And you'll end up, uh, could blow out, uh, no, you'll, you'll darken the whole thing so that you get the highlights perfect every time. So 
That's how that goes. That's all right. Got it. Okay, so here you go. Here's some pictures of uh, metering. This is what is depicted as the matrix metering. It's just across the entire screen. There's not any one spot that it's metering. It's metering everything and averaging the entire frame, basically. So the next one is the center weighted. The center weight is, you can see, it's with the red circle in the center. Uh, this is how this particular manufacturer shows it uh, in this graphic, is that it is the center looks like about one quarter of the screen, maybe. Um, so you've got a highlight. And you can see how the young lady, the background is perfectly exposed in this. The young lady is dark. And if we go, uh, if now we're doing uh, the uh, spot metering, and the spot is just on her. So now she's perfectly exposed, and the background is blown out. So how do you get around that? Uh, lots of different ways. Always shoot and draw number one, uh, because it's basically having a negative to work with uh, from the dark side of life. You can now dodge and burn with, uh, I use Photoshop and Lightroom a lot. I'm sure a lot of you do. And so you can now choose sections to mask and, and change the exposure, especially if you were in, um, if you're working with a raw file. And so, um, so it, these are just the metering mechanisms. How you actually use them is another story. So, and how you manage them. Okay, perspective. Uh, lenses are really a fun thing to play with. Um, they, the, the manufacturer gave us so many to play with because sometimes we're not able to walk right up to the animal and uh, you know get that picture. Or the uh, athlete on the football field is coming at you and you really don't want to get run over by this 250 pound professional athlete. That kind of a thing. So they give us all kinds of lenses. Um, and the other side of that would be, you don't want to have to take 14 pictures with a long focal length lens to get a nice landscape picture. So you get, they give us wide angles. Go to the next one. So in these three pictures, what I've done is the side of the back end of my car was the most photographic, uh, pho yeah, photogenic part of my car. Why, I don't know. But it ended up this way. So this is the same, it's a zoom lens that I'm using. Uh, and so, and I've also done a couple of tricks. The 28 millimeter um, is actually a DX format. The other ones are full frame formats. So I could get the 28 millimeter. Uh, no, the, the first two, 50 and 28 and 50 are the full frame and the 100 is a, a DX format so that I can get the extended uh, focal length. But if you look at the picture, in the 28 millimeter, the car is this, about the same size as it is in the other two. But look how much information is in the background. There's buildings. There's a huge building back there with lots of trees around, sidewalks, light posts, all kinds of things. And all I did was zoom in just a little bit to get to the 50 millimeter section. And now all of a sudden I can start to read, oh, it's the school of nursing. The building is almost completely gone as a building. It's just a portion of it. All those trees are just about gone. And so we're, we're now getting narrow. And then when I went to 100 millimeters or the equivalent thereof, there's no, there's yeah, a little bit of sky level um, where I had probably 10 or 20 windows showing in the 28 millimeter frame. I only have about six, five or six or eight. I got half that one. The car is still the same size. So that lens pulls the background closer and closer as you get a longer lens. Now, this is just one example of using the lens in perspective. Other people will, you know, you can take a wide angle lens, get close to your subject and get that, that part in focus or a little bit further past it. And then uh, use the high point hyperfocal length of the lens to get the rest of it in focus. Well, more commonly known as a depth of field. Or, and I did not do, uh, I did not put one on here, and that is focus stacking. That's a whole different animal. It's fun, but it's a whole different animal. So, 
We had a question from Richard. Yes. <clears throat> he wanted to say, he didn't say exactly what, but he's still wanting to know more about focal length. Do you have a lens of different focal length to show them? Or would you like to get one? Um, what is focal length? Yes. Grab. You have a there? Um, no, no, not that one. No. Grab the house of one sitting on the silver lens. And then um, in my, yeah, let's let's start with that. In my backpack, there's another lens. What's the difference between the wide angle? Okay, so I'm going to make my, make me take my camera apart. If, uh, it's in a yellow bag tucked away underneath the flap. Okay, so uh, just to start things off, um, this lens is a, what is this, 150 millimeter lens for a two and a quarter camera. Okay, so it, it's huge. Uh, and in and of itself, it's just big. If you look on the back, the uh, Framing in the back is almost two and a quarter inches. I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute. Okay. 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 Um, I'm going to get one of the lens while you're at. Oh, yeah. That's, we have less than 350. I got the wrong line. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. Hello again. Okay, so okay, so we have three lenses, um, and lens manufacturers are funny people. They like to make them. That's two different focal lengths. This is a fifty millimeter. This is a hundred and fifty millimeter. That's the optics inside. One is a wide angle. That's this black one. Uh, for two and a quarter, this is a wide angle lens at, at 50 millimeters. Uh, that means that um, when you're looking through it, the angle of view is, uh, I forget what this one is, but it's somewhere we'll call it about a, a 60 degree angle. So it picks up an awful lot. This one is one third of that. So it's about a 20 degree angle. It's 150 millimeters. It's a factor of three, so therefore the angle changes by a factor of three. So the angle now is very narrow and it's about uh, 20 degrees of view. Your eyes see, what is that, 100 and call it 180. Some of us have, some people have better peripheral vision and may even have a little bit more than 180 degrees. So this one is wide, but not as wide as the human eye. This one is extremely narrow at one third of this. And then, so now they had to, they actually had to extend. So this is a three, 300, no, 250 millimeter lens. This is, uh, so we've got another factor going on here. It's not quite doubling this. So the view on this one, instead of say 20 degrees here, the view is maybe um, 12 degrees on this one. So it's again, narrowing it down so that I'm getting closer to the person or the object that I wish to photograph without ever moving the camera. And you gain some things with that. You're not, you're not physically moving. Um, but then again, depending on the quality of the lens, uh, and when you get to a certain point, no matter how great the lens is, unless it's one of those fourteen thousand dollar lenses for Canon or Nikon, um, it's not going to be that great. So, as one of my instructors told me a long time ago, we give you three lenses. If they're not close enough, walk up to the object. If they're not far enough, back up. So, uh, thank you, Uncle Sam. So, <laughs> Uh, bipedal zoom. Yeah. So if you buy a zoom, then you get to do all of that once. Oh, by the way, these are considered prime lenses because they do not zoom. 
they're set at a specific focal length. That's it. Um, and they're tuned, if you will, to what they're supposed to be doing. They, they are extremely sharp lenses because of who manufactures these. Um, these are, this is uh, Zeiss, yeah. Carl Zeiss makes lenses for Crossover, or did. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. I get too technical sometimes. So if I, if I when did I go too technical? Okay. Because I don't want to do that. Okay, depth of field. This is another one that is uh, very fun to figure out. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're going to go to that. So um, okay. this lens. Oops. Did it not? The button didn't work. Here. There we go. Okay. So that's this lens right here that's in my hand. Okay. That's on the screen. Uh, back in the day, uh, again, this is a film camera. I had the money to buy a digital back, but uh, back in the day, the uh, manufacturers of these lenses, whether they did it with little red marks on the lenses, as you see on the screen, or they had tick marks on your lens itself on a 35 millimeter, they showed where uh, if you focused at, like in the first one, F4, the depth of field is about 150 feet to infinity. Okay, and that's between the two little red marks on the lens. So as, as you stop down the lens to F16 on this one, now all of a sudden the depth of field or the hyperfocal the, the length of the lens changes, and your depth of field is now 40 feet to infinity. So I can stand here, and if I'm at F4, I have to be, to get everything in focus to infinity, the first object has to be at 150 feet away from me. If I'm at F16, then the first object is going to be 40 feet away from me to infinity. Now, I, I picked infinity just because it makes it easy to see. It can be anything that you want. Uh, and then at F32, uh, the depth of field halves, and it's about 22 feet, give or take. Uh, and then from there to infinity, this lens actually stays in focus. Okay. So, yes, it's not focus stacking. Yes, there's a little bit of softness to it, but it's the way I, it's the way I do uh, Questions on that one? Because that's always a fun one topic. Uh, okay. Okay. So in these pictures, Two different, uh, two different focal lengths. Uh, again, my flex body back there. And I'm using this lens. Yes, it has the red marks on it. And this is a 50 millimeter lens in the, uh, the picture on the left-hand side, the hoodoos in New Mexico. Uh, and so I focused that one approximately, well, I focused basically on the front hoodoo, the front uh, object and then made sure that this lens was set so that it would be in focus all the way to the rear where that hill is in the background. And that's all done with depth of field lenses. There was no focus stacking at that time. And so that is using the lens, the, the capability of the lens to get everything that you want in focus as best as possible. Um, now, on the other hand, same camera body, flex body, using this lens, the 150 millimeter, and then I put a 1.4, I, I really pushed this one. Uh, this is 150 millimeters with a 1.4 teleconverter on it. Uh, and, that, and then it, uh, probably I was about F4 or F, maybe F8 at the most. Um, and so it took away all of the depth of focus. The, also I, I had the ability to put an extension in between. So this was really strange. This had <laughs> film, my camera, my, my body was here, and then the lens was here because I had a bellows extension, which that camera does, pushes my lens out, 
And then I had a teleconverter between that bellows extension. And so I was really pushing the limits of this thing. Uh, and hence that flower is probably an inch, two inches high. The, the yellow pieces in there, maybe you were an inch. And so that filled, that was, that's almost the full frame of the camera. What a shot. How far was the lens when you planted? With oddly enough, I had to stay back with this thing. This is, uh, I was probably 10, 12 feet back. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I shot, uh, see, Gary put together uh, an outing in, in October at some flower place up in Cedar Park. And he was amazed. He watched me walk around with this thing, just set up. Like, what in the sand? I said, well, this is what I know. You know. I'm taking pictures of flowers like 20 feet away, and they're filling the frame. And I was like, yeah, that's what I do. Um, yeah, I'll watch it. So you can use the lens to do a lot of different things. Um, you can buy extension tubes for your cameras, by the way. I think we're, uh, who's doing that talk? You are. Yes. Bill's going to be doing a talk later on in the year on using extensions for macro capability of your camera. Close-up photography. Close-up photography. This is kind of close-up photography. <laughs> I hesitate to use the word macro because everybody has their definition for it. Yeah, yeah. This is this is quasi macro. When I when I put the full extension on the cam on that camera and I used my fifty millimeter lens, I'm almost at a one to one, uh, which on a two hundred. Yes. So what, what is your depth of field on the machine back there? Is that really that close by? Yeah, the depth of field um, is about um, six inches. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I've just had it for a while. Yeah, because I, I focused on the front one and the back and saw, and there can't be more than two or three inches between them. So, it, uh, yeah, it's very, very, very shallow depth of, focus, or depth of field on this. So, okay, let's go on to the next topic. Okay, support systems. I know this is so much fun. I'm excited to talk about support systems. Okay. okay. Everybody has a I, I just listed them. I didn't think you guys really wanted to see pictures of trial. Uh, but do you have a beanbag picture? No, no, I don't even have a beanbag. I got plant though. My God, do I have a plant? It's a sucker will hold on to any. It's a light plant. And uh, it doesn't go anywhere. I put a little ball head on it. It's, uh, I push it when I put the flex body on there. But uh, okay, so you got tripods, monopods. Uh, you got uh, clamps, you got bean bags or rice bags. Um, let's see, what else have I seen people There's skimmer pods. Whatever you can find. I mean, I've actually just leaned the camera up against the tree when the wind wasn't blowing. <laughs> uh, and my, I, I was in the Bosque del Apache one time, and I thought, ooh, look, I can just stand here on the top, on, on the edge of the car, and you know, inside the doorway, and I'll just rest myself on there in the engine front. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, it doesn't work. You know, well, I'm going to turn the engine off. Now I can take that picture. No, they don't. I'm gone. I don't know what to do with this one. So uh, generally, uh, uh, the, the more gray hair you get, the more support systems you need. <laughs> 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 Uh, you guys can mention rocks, you know. Rocks, work. yeah. Oh, I, I use just about everything. Uh, you know, middle of the night, I had a Nikon D D80, and so yeah, I just set it on a rock, and then you walk, leave the shutter open, walk around, and do flashes on the ground. Cool, nice. Because I didn't want to carry the tripod and everything else with me. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, Chandelier National Monument at one time, they've got some railings here and there. And I took my, my light clamp hook up, clamped it onto the railing. I was like, don't touch the railing, kind of like, you know, telling the other people. And I, my camera's on. Oh, okay, thank you. They get off and go on my way instead of carrying a tripod. So, uh, yeah, it, it's support systems. You got to have. 
So, okay, I see I've been uh, moved on the white balance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see how Bill thinks about what I thought about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, white balance. What is it? Okay. Um, the short version of it is the you take a piece of white paper, photograph it in the sun. <clears throat> Maybe it's got a black line on it so you can see where the focus is. You want that piece of white paper to look white when you finish with your picture. Okay. Your camera may not think that it's white. It may think that the light bouncing off of it is something else. Okay. It could be incandescent. It could be any wavelength of an LED lamp that is out there these days. Um, a flash, we all think, is daylight. And it's slightly cooler than daylight, so it's a little bit more blue. So white balance is getting that white in there or some color that you want to actually represent the color that it was when you photographed it. So if you go to the next one, I get a little more in depth. So uh, you have lots of different modes on your cameras. Uh, and it is so, I, I, again, I did not put pictures up. I just want to just talk about them real quick. So you've got the auto mode. A lot of us shoot, I, I shoot my camera in auto mode for white balance. Um, then you have sunlight, and then you have incandescent or cloudy. Uh, you've got shade. Each one of those is a slightly different shade of white. Sunlight is considered white. Okay. We all depict it as yellow because that's what we like to see in the sunsets. But in the middle of the day, at high noon, it's considered white. Okay. When you put a cloud over, uh, it doesn't have to be dense clouds. It just has to be some clouds. All of a sudden, now you're uh, knocking that sun down a little bit in intensity, but you're also changing the color temperature ever so slightly. It now has a blue cast to it. And the more shade you get, the bluer that cast will go. And so that's why maybe even today, um, they don't call this any of the 80, 81A filter, which was a slight yellow filter. And it took the blue cast out of a lot of things uh, for film primarily. I asked the guy when I bought my, new, my, my, my camera uh, about a year and a half ago, and I said, yeah, I need to get an 81A. Oh, it comes over and shows me the southern planet filter. So this is the Okay, it's a UV filter. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Same thing, they just changed the name. Okay, uh, incandescent. These lights in this room right now are incandescent. Um, they may be LED. I don't know what the church put in. Uh, I'm glad they did. Last year they were nasty yellow. Uh, so, and then you've got fluorescent, uh, and fluorescents have changed a lot. Uh, now you'll you get fluorescent LEDs. And I've yet to understand what that means. Okay. But you can't buy a fluorescent bulb anymore with uh, the powder in it that uh, uh, causes the, the color to feel the light to show up and, and the color. Um, but in, you walk into some places and do offices and stores and you take a happy snap and you're not in, and you're in sunlight mode. Don't be surprised that you get a green room or a deeply brown room, because if the, if the overhead lights are, are fluorescent and they're uh, warm, then you've got it on the wrong setting, and then guess what you're going to end up with a really strange looking color. Fortunately, in Photoshop, in Photoshop, you can go change the color temperature. And so if we go to the next one, sir, uh, the color temperatures. Yay, here we go, ta -da, the color temperatures. Uh, I, I was really fast. Wow, I really truncated. Oh, on well, my screen, there was a there was a bleed of red, not just a red bar. Is that a red bar to you, or is it a, is it bleeding over? Uh, on the far left, half and half, actually. I, oh, it's it's any bar on that screen and a smooth transition. Yeah, it's a smooth on transition on the computer, and there's a big bar over here on the screen. Okay, so color temperature. This is where we, we get into the technical aspects of white light and what have you. White light is considered 5,000 degrees Kelvin on this thing. Sunlight, as it says right in this area. 
And so when you start introducing clouds, then it moves over to the left hand or to the right hand side um, and starts to get a little more blue. Um, there's a filter on your camera. Uh, most of them are IR filters, but there's, a, there's got to be another one because they've got to knock out the UV. Otherwise, you'd end up with really strange looking pictures. We don't even, I'm, I'm assuming that the UV filter is on there. Um, it's in the stack in front of the silicon. Yeah, yeah, because it's, um, yeah, I, I, I worked in that field of UV radiation and sensors and what have you. We had to make sure everything was taken off before we and we were, we were imaging way over here in the UV, deep UV range. Uh, so, um, okay, so you've got uh, sunlight at 5,000 flash. Uh, the, the flash on your camera is pretty much uh, set um, to probably close to 5,000 and or when it's, you, you activate your flash on your camera, your camera's computer automatically resets the uh, white balance to match that flash. So it's already been built in. <clears throat> But if you take another flash, a studio flash, and you set it up and you fire off at sunlight, you're going to get a blue cast because the, of the lights that, they're, that are in there. Uh, and then if you move down incandescent, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Edison uh, invented the light bulb with a tungsten filament. Uh, we call it tungsten uh, back then. Back then it was tungsten. And at the way over on the far left, the 3000 is called halogen. Uh, there's tungsten halogen bulbs. This is what that is by today's standards. And it's very yellow. So, but you can play with it. It's a lot of fun to do this. If you would go to the, hopefully I didn't put another. Yeah, there we go. Yes, it's, it's, it's a rather morbid picture, by the way. This is at the New Mexico State Penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And this is the gas chamber. Okay, so when I was photographing the penitentiary, I, I was like, this is really a morbid place. And I felt, I just felt that it was cold. And so what I did was I set my camera on tungsten and then I pulled out my flash and photographed the steam. And so I got this really deep blue cast across the image. And I photographed the image probably 75% of everything I photographed on that, uh, on that shoot was done in, in that mode, was, was done with like a, a tungsten filter uh, or the filtration for tungsten light, uh, even though it was raw daylight. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it's just, you kind of had that feeling. And so, uh, but so you can use the filtration on your, on your camera to, to change things as you're shooting, instead of waiting to get back to the, digital darkroom change it there or you can shoot it and then you can change it in the digital darkroom either way um, but it is what it is so okay moving on okay oh look it's the exposure triangle <laughs> okay see i told you i had a neat graphic there it is oh okay uh <laughs> Yes, I'm a former engineer and I'm a citizen to give her. Okay, so in this case, they put the aperture on the side ISO on one side and the shutter speed at the bottom. So no matter what you do, if you change one, you're going to change something else or maybe two something else. This assumes that light is constant. This is not even playing with, by the way, I'm, I'm walking in and out of shaded areas. This is, the light is constant. And so you've got this. Um, and so you want to, we were talking about shutter speeds and there's a debate uh, as in everything, there's always a debate. And shutter speed, I kind of agree, kind of comes in number one as the controlling device on your camera because you can adjust the ISO to help with your shutter speed or diminish your shutter speed, whatever you want to call it. Or you can adjust your aperture, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Landscape guys want infinity from here to infinity in focus. So the aperture for them 
is the key. Sports guys, gals want to have stop the action or blur the action, depending on what they want to do. That's probably the most dynamic of all of the different types of photography is action work, sports work. And so you, you've got to figure out what you want and then pick it and then work from there. Okay. Um, and you, your camera is in, inside uh, your viewfinder as you adjust one aspect, the ISO, the shutter speed, or the aperture, you'll start to see the exposure bars, whatever you have in your camera, shifting from one side to the other or up and down, depending on how it's set up. So play with it one time. Just go in and start playing with it and, and sit there and go, click, click. oh, that's why that moves. It's I did this, I did that. Uh, again, um, play with your camera as much as you can so that when you get out into the field to shoot, you have no problems understanding what you need when you need it. Um, so the, there's, that, that's about as easy a, or simple of an explanation I have for the exposure triangle. Because if you, you're changing something, it's going to change. You, you change one, it's going to change the next. So yeah, this is another little explanation of a very brief. Um, and I, as I said, you, your light is actually in control. Okay, Depending on how much light you have, then chip, you pick your shutter speed, and then perhaps you should check and, and set your aperture. And if you have the ability, if you're not shooting film, then you start to work with the ISO. Uh, I like landscapes and, and flowers, and so I start the other way around. I start with the lowest ISO and the widest, or the, yeah, sometimes the most closed down aperture, and then I adjust my sh uh, shutter speed because I'm on a tripod most of the time. But if you're handheld, you can't do that. Handheld, you're going to be probably at 100. Uh, hundredth of a second, um, maybe a little bit less than that, one sixtieth. Um, if you've got less gray hair than I do, maybe you can get down to one thirtieth. You know, so um, so that's that's how that works. And then then you adjust even the parts of your camera to match it. Barbara's looking at me like, what are you talking about? You pick your ISO and you look at the instrument based on how you hear it like a shutter speed, or do the opposite. I do the opposite for all shut usually start playing with my shutter speed to get it. I'll look up my ISO slope, but then I'll use my shutter speed to get it where I want to be and then take a picture with it. Okay, so the question was do I do I adjust um what do I adjust to get my uh my graph my, my scaling correct? Um it, it, it's, that's the nice thing about cameras and photographers. You can do whatever you wish. There's nothing that says you have to do it one way or the other. Um, most of everything that I've shot landscape wise uh, is on film, so there are no histograms uh, until I get to Photoshop. You know, I have to digitize it. Um, I, and, and I, use my eye an awful lot in the camera. I don't use histograms, I'm terrible about that until I get to where I need to be uh, in the dark room. Um, so yes, I know there are times when I've done that, I've looked to make sure that I can, I'm, I'm within the boundaries, um, but I also shoot raw. And so when I shoot raw, then I can adjust bits and pieces of the, of the image. That's, that's how I've come about to do this now, um, especially with, you know, I think within the last year, um, Lightroom came up with their, uh, and, and, and raw processing and Photoshop, same thing. They give you they, they give you the ability to draw a mask on your picture uh, and then adjust that mask and then set up another mask and, and adjust that one, or even do a, a mask inside the mask and so it's it's incredible what they're allowing you to do. Um, you know, we think that the masters of yesteryear didn't do that kind of stuff. It's like, oh my God, yes, they did. Ansel Adams, I mean, I've got one of his pictures at home, just I haven't been able to acquire them. It's not a, a 
he did it, like one of his you know, grunts did it. But it's still, it's a lovely picture, but it's like the third version of it. And it's the sun, it's the moon over Hernandez with the sky. And the first one I understand is actually gray. And then the second one was a dark gray. And then the third one was almost black. And that's the one that I have. And it's just, he changed his mind as he went along. He said, I, I like it better this way. So that's the nice thing about photography. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. Just it doesn't sound. <laughs> not real. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's your reality. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so here's a quick little chart of increase and decrease. So um, if we have the ISO and we don't change the ISO, but you increase uh, your shutter speed, well, then you have to make a change to your aperture. And you've got to uh, open that up. You've got to go to a lower number. Conversely, is if you leave the ISO where it is and you uh, lower your shutter speed, then you have to close. You have to open or close down. Excuse me. You have to close down your aperture. I'm not going to go through all six. Of them. Otherwise, you're going to listen to me early before you. <laughs> but it is. Th this is the basic chart of the triangle. This is the triangle put into a chart for those who like to have charts. So um, this is, it, it doesn't work any other way. That's unfortunate. You can push it, you can get it right to the edge of any of these where you're now, you know, like blowing out um, like fashion photographers. They'll shoot something and they've got it so overlit and they've got their shutter speed wherever they want it, but they've opened their aperture up so that there's no depth of field whatsoever. And, um, and the model is standing there with a white background and the whole thing is just bleed white all the way around. That's what they want, but they've pushed it to the edge of the exposure triangle, if you will. And so it's, it's amazing how that happens. And same thing um, with, uh, well, landscape guys do it, and uh, photographers do it as well. They do it in, in the opposite side. They'll go out, um, I think I took out a picture, but um, my wife, I, I lived in New Mexico for 11 years, so that's why New Mexico shows up in my conversation a lot. And I leave at four o'clock in the morning so I could get to a site an hour's drive away so that I could watch and photograph the moon setting as the sun was rising. And so, yeah. You, you push that, and by the way, moons are actually at F16 over the shutter, or over the ASA or the ISO. Just so you know. Uh, sunny 16. Sunny 16 or lunar 16, whichever way you want to put it. So, um, yeah, she she thought I was crazy, but she still does. But oh, <laughs> she should know. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go into a little bit of land. Uh, each one of the types of three types of photography that I uh, kind of get into landscape photography, uh, action photography, which I do very little of, and then um, uh, the third one is portrait photography. So, landscape, it's, uh, it's amazing. We go out and we see a scene and we go, Whoo! and we get back to the uh, house and we get on our computer. We go, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. It's because we see in three dimensions plus color. Your camera sees in two dimensions. And if you're lucky, it's in color, you know. But so it only sees in two dimensions. You have to pull that third dimension out. And the third dimension gets pulled out through the use of um, masks and burning and dodging and cropping. And so you start to manipulate your image. And all of a sudden, now you have something close to what you thought you saw in your mind's eye. So it's, it's a, with every type of photography, there's always something that you got to do. And in landscape photography, you go out and you see it, you have to remember it up here until you finish processing it on the, uh, now on the computer. Otherwise, you, you're just like, well, I, and I, talk, I took lots and lots and lots and lots of landscape pictures before I realized that's what I had to do. So, um, yeah. Next one. Yeah, please. 
So here's the yeah, the screen is closed now. <laughs> okay, white sands, which is really white on this screen. Uh, that's early, uh, relatively early morning you know, in February. Uh, the camera club I belong to over there, uh, we would do a, a trip to White Sands on every President's Day. Uh, and so we would get in at pre dawn and go out and hike around and take pictures wherever we wanted to. It was great. And so this is uh, a couple hours into after dawn. You can see the shadows there are from the grass. And, uh, but that's again taken with my house plug, flex body. Uh, I'm a film guy, so sorry, it's what I did back then. And um, I can't tell you exactly, but I'll tell you right now it's at F32. Let's see, F22. I'll tell you that. Uh, it's at F22. This was shot on ProView, which is a 100 ISO film. And so whatever the shutter speed was, that's what it was. I didn't care. So I was on a truck file. So this other one is local. Um, this is in Colorado Bend. Bend State Park. Yes. And this is the waterfall. Gorman Falls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gorman Falls. It was the first place that I went to. Uh, I had to find some place to shoot a uh, landscape photograph. And so uh, that's very hard, in my opinion, in Texas to do. So, um, so I, I found this one again. It's uh, with my 50 millimeter uh, on my flex body. It's uh, ISO 100 Rovia. It has a very slow shutter speed because the mist coming down, I wanted to make sure that it looked and stayed as a mist. So it's got a sh slow shutter speed. And again, whatever uh, the uh, aperture in this case was adjusted to meet what I wanted in my, what I thought I saw in my head, my mind's eye, to get that uh, misty look over here on the, uh, underneath the, the rock. So it's just a something that you, you got to do over and over. And you'll find I, I, a lot of you guys are really quite good at it. So, uh, okay. oh, here we go. This is the moonshot that I was talking about. My wife thought I was nuts. Um, it's a tiny, tiny white moon. Can't see it in the clouds very well on that screen, but right there. Yeah, right there. There's a moon. Uh, for those that are online, it's in the clouds, at the, right at the top edge of the clouds. If they can see it pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so this was taken just as the sun was rising and cresting over the uh, over the horizon, because the bottom is dark, and that's the shadow of the Earth across that formation, and the rest of it is the sun coming up on the formation. So it's Cabazon Peak is the name of it, and it is a volcanic plug that uh, everything is just washed away from it. Um, so. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun place. There's actually a little town bottom there, but you, you can only get there on Easter Sunday. That's the only day of the year they open up because they have mats. And so a lot of photographers, they upset their spouses and their families that they go there instead of going to church on Easter Sunday. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, here's the action picture that I was talking about. This is Joe Frazier just about ready to knock Muhammad Ali out or knock him down, I should say, he never knocked him out. But if you notice in this picture, okay, so it's brightly lit uh, because this was televised and television cameras back then were just as terrible as you could ever be for sensors. And so uh, they've got a ton of light uh, just coming down. You can see it in the background over their heads. Um, so there's lots of light, but film was even worse than the sensors on the camera. This was probably photographed with what was called Triax 400 at the time. It's an ISO film 400. The, I don't know what the uh, f-stop was. It was probably wide open, whatever that camera was that the gentleman was, was using. And the shutter speed is probably close to, I would say probably 250 or maybe 500 of a second. 
Uh, in my estimation, in the dark room, when they were processing this film, they actually pushed it. It's called pushing your film, and they got uh, at least one and a half, maybe two more f stops out of it. And that's how they got the image at all. At all. But if you notice, this is a, a high shutter speed at the right moment. Three out of the four feet of the boxers are off the ground. The fist is hitting uh, Ali's head. There's a, a spray of, of sweat coming out of his hair. And this is the quintessential action photographer, you know, photograph of that time was to catch that. Today in uh, football and basketball, that's what they're doing. And in, in the case where Bill enjoys going and, and doing the uh, motorsports, it's the opposite. You want the background to be blurred so that you can show motion. In this case, it's you're showing motion by stopping it, but at the critical moment. So it's it's a very interesting kind of mishmash of you know, you've got to know your cameras, you got to know what your sensors are able to do, and all that fun stuff. And so if you do the next one, this is a really classic shot right here. <laughs> this is my idea of how to do it. Okay, same little girl, little uh, with with uh, big sister running in the background. Uh, but okay, the only thing I can do on uh, this screen, the only thing that's really in focus are her pink pants. Uh, her head's moving, um, but pants are actually the oddly enough still, and the bracket at the top is almost still. So again, as this was at fiftieth of a second. The background is blurred all the heck, um, but that's what I was trying to get. Uh, so I wanted to show that specifically for this class. The kids don't care. <laughs> Her mom was happier to, to see the pictures of them hanging in the trees. So, uh, yeah. Okay, portrait photography. This is a really interesting topic. A lot of people, uh, including myself, I enjoy doing it when I can, uh, but I'm scared to death to do it at the same time. It's because I'm dealing directly with the person. Landscape doesn't talk back to you. It doesn't care. And it doesn't tell you how bad you know. So, um, but how do they wish to be portrayed? So you got to have a conversation with them ahead of time. You just can't go and oh, it's like, oh, boom, shoot the picture and run away. Unless you're doing street photography. That's a whole different kind of portraiture. And so uh, I, I have two examples in here where we're on both sides of it. Of uh, that equation. So you got to think about what, what's going on. How do you want to depict them? Uh, do they have uh, classic portraiture? Is that you actually paid attention to the roundness or, or, or smooth, uh, the slimness of the face so that you lit it properly? Because if you light a round face this way, it'll look about this big. So you light them from the sides. And if you have someone who has a narrow face and you light them from the sides, they're going to have a really narrow face. It's going to be very, very small. So you, you know, just some of the classic things. But um, people like to do whatever they like to do and they like to be, you know, so uh, photographed. Um, yeah, so is it impromptu work, street photography, or are you actually setting up in some kind of a studio, quasi-studio setting? So if you would, sir. So, um, oh, lighting the subject, yeah, we just talked about that. So, yeah, you, I'm not going to go into a lighting class on, on portrait work, but it, you got to be careful of it. You just have to make sure that you're lighting, you're exposing generally for some portion of the skin, uh, depending on the person's uh, race uh, or nationality or ethnic background, whatever way you want to call it. Uh, skin is a very interesting object that we all have. But it all records differently, very, very differently on the, on the cameras. So, if you would Yeah. Okay. So, here's my, uh, oh my gosh. Really got to go Okay. So, this guy's name on the, on the left hand side, his name is Stephen. That's about all I know about Stephen because I went up to him at the, um, out of the, oh, what's that? The, 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 ah! The fair, uh, Renaissance? the Renaissance, yeah, area. But it was a, they did a different, they were having a different one at the time. It wasn't the Renaissance. 
So I was out there at a nice warm sunny afternoon, lots of beautiful sunlight and with coming through the leaves and what have you. And I saw this guy and I just walked up to him and said, may I take your picture? And he was like, um, yeah. And his wife was like, why didn't you take mine? I wanted to take his. So, uh, and I, I asked him for his contact information and I sent him a picture and I said, may I use it in, you know, in public and vote and publish it. He said, yes, and it's, it's here. Um, very simple. All I had him do was he, he followed my directions fairly well. Uh, I had him not look at me in the camera. It's like, look at the camera. No, 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 don't look at the camera. Please look over here. Oh, okay. And so I had him move his head, move his eyes, um, and that was it. And it was no more than two minutes, three minutes, other than him typing in his stuff, his information on my phone call to see if I could contact him later. The other gentleman, Thomas, uh, this was a modeling uh, session. Um, if you check with Precision Camera, every so often they do these things. This was at the uh, Old West uh, Ghost Town out there on 290 on the way to uh, Maynard. And so, uh, this was a Canon sponsor event. So here I am running around with my night <laughs> They didn't care. They just wanted, you know, they, they sponsored somebody, you know, you could use their cameras. That, that's the other cool thing. So I'm um, not to push uh, precision. They're a nice company. But, uh, if you get a chance to go to a uh, corporate sponsored event, go spend whatever it is. This was like 99 bucks to go. They had five models. We had the run of the place until from like 10 o'clock, maybe earlier till two o'clock and we got lunch time. And so, uh, and I could have stopped using my camera and I could have picked up a, a Canon setup at any time and they would have been more than happy. Uh, a few weeks later, I went to the Nikon sponsored event, which was at the Austin FC practice field. And the uh, our, our rep there, it goes, uh, so you want to try the new camera? Yeah, sure. So he hands me a Z9 with the, I forget what lens it was, but it was this huge lens on it. And he had set it up. I did might have been because we were not allowed to be anywhere near the players. And so we were photographing on the other end of the pitch. The I was photographing goalies practicing on the other end, which is like 300 yards away. So I was shooting like 30 frames a second and nothing because it was 300 yards no matter what lens you're using, it still looked like. So um, if you get a chance to go, go. March 18th, go. I found out yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Uh, I was, I, I suppose I, I signed up for something for Saturday and I thought I was not going to be able to make it a call. Uh, and talking with the young lady on the phone, and she, I said, I really like doing those bottle shoots. And she goes, well, I'll tell my boss. And then he was like, okay, I'll tell you about the one that Sony's doing. It's on March 18th. And I said, will the fee for this one cover the fee for that one? Yes, it does. I said, great. And so it's at Q2 Stadium, and it's a model shoot. So if you get online, they might have it out there right now. Use the Sony equipment, bring your own. But, they don't care. Uh, but it's fun because somebody else is paying for the models to stand there. And you tell them what to do when you get pictures. So uh, that's Thomas. Thomas is one of the models. Uh, and he and I, at late in the afternoon, uh, or late in the session, we're walking around together. I said, oh, I'm just standing there. Yeah. I said, ah. He goes, that building over there has some interesting things to it. So we went inside this building that looked, looked like a church uh, and it had a bar in the back, which is kind of where he's standing in this picture. And you can't see the window. That is not a window in the background. That's actually a mirror. Um, and so the, the window was further over about where Stephen's nose is. And then the door was behind him and off to the far, his left. And so uh, then this stark light coming into this dark room Voila, it looks a whole lot better on the laptop. But 
That has got to be one of the, probably one of my best pictures for portraits. And it just happened to um, I in, in the case of, of Thomas, the uh, metering was done on this side, on his, his left side, because it was the lesser of the two. Was, we got, got a little bit blown out on this side, but on this side, it was just like perfect. And so the back the backlight is what I use to meter for him. Um, and so that's, and it just worked out. And I worked my tail off in Photoshop. Uh, otherwise, doing a lot of things to it. Lots of masking, lots of changing of exposure here and there. Um, so, yeah. Mid-year, Gary is going to do a Photoshop presentation for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah, and it's going to be on, and if I'm not mistaken, what this is going to be is, is uh, to make a change, uh, to make a change to your purpose, to your image in Photoshop. I don't know if do so it. don't just process it and give us a pretty picture with red, whites, and blues. It's to keep that. take a picture and change, purposely change, just and just force I, something into it. This will be the graphics card. It's basically the way I would. So, okay, okay. Um, okay. Um, oh, lens selection and portrait photography. Normally it's between 55 and 85 millimeters, uh, 35 millimeters, full frame format. Um, and most of the time, they're uh, very fast lenses. Uh, I use a, a 80, uh, an 85 uh, millimeter lens, 1.8 uh, f uh, for those pictures. That's what I was shooting. So, but yeah, normally you don't want the background being distracting. So you use something with lots of great focus. Yeah. Oh, filters and add-ons. There are filters and add-ons. How's that? We just stop there for that. Okay. <laughs> You can buy them and put them on, do whatever you want. There are a ton of them. Yep, there they are. Filters. Yep. You can get neutral density, split neutral density. You can get health filters. You can get special effect filters. We can go on to the next slide. Because I'm about to put everybody to sleep. Manual versus automatic. Yes, there is. Okay. Go ahead. This is a quick one. It's one slide. Don't worry. I'm not going to get you anywhere. Manual operate. Well, um, automatic operation generally. You guys that do uh, nature and sports and action stuff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you normally put yourself on some form of, nope, you're using a manual? Um, I'm doing all manual. Okay. I can't, but I can't, I've never been on all manual. Okay. <laughs> You'll die on it. Well, it's a very good photographer, too. I am okay. the opposite. I use a lot of aperture priority or, or uh, yeah, it should be priority, you know, because I'm aiming for something specific. Yeah, yeah, you might have to repeat that. Okay, so some some people are using manual only for their nature and action work. That's all they use. That's because they know their camera is exceptionally well, and they can make the adjustment as necessary. And other people like to use perhaps aperture um, aperture control or priority, where they want to have a special a specific effect with the bokeh or the depth of field. Others may say, I just want to have shutter speed priority to stop or blur things, no matter what, like I did in my examples. I, it, was a, it was a manual setup, but it was um, shutter speed priority in, in my mind, essentially. So, okay. That's it for my manual and all my conversation. There's one reason to put your camera on that and that's when you had somebody else having to take the picture of you. <laughs> and then you then that, but that's the only exception to put a camera in the car. Did we just hear the same podcast today? Because I heard somebody else talking about that today. <laughs> I, I would, well, okay, from, from, um, you might have to repeat that. And certain aspects, okay, the, the comment was that you put your, put your camera in automatic mode is when somebody is going to, you hand the camera to another person and they take a picture of you. And then you put it back into the boat that you wish and keep on photographing whatever you're doing. Um, I will agree to, I will agree with that statement. There's no doubt about that. There are times where professional photographers are only in automatic mode. And it's like if this room was filled, which I photographed a reception here. Oh my gosh. No, 
There's, I'm not about to do that but in manual mode and sit there and adjust things up and down and back and forth. I put it in automatic mode uh, and shot, and I had a flash on it, so it just did it for me. And it was the easiest, fastest way, and the client was took it. Thing. You shot it big again? No, I shot both. Oh, I shot dual JPEG raw, yeah, and then threw out all the raw because I didn't use it. Yeah, wasted a lot of space on my thing. Space cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so if, if you're going to use manual, just it, it's a it is fun, and I do shoot a lot of things manual. I, I agree with you, um, and because. I know where I want the exposure to be, and I don't want to sit there and fiddle around and get a plus one or minus meter. It's like just watch the gauge, you know, watch the meter inside the, the viewfinder and it goes, oh, okay, there's a third of the stop. And then, you know, look at it. I think for me, it comes down to the fact that if I screw up a picture, I want to screw up the picture, not have it. No, who's going to screw up the picture? Okay. Um, yeah, shoot with film. We won't screw up the picture, I promise you. Because <laughs> it's expensive and you don't, you get, you know, on a roll, even 35 millimeter, you only get 36 shots and then you gotta swap it out. Okay, enough of that silliness. <laughs> Let me go on. What do we got? You just passed your thank you. Oh, slide. did I say thank you? Um, okay, so my contact information if you want to contact me, if you wish. And my, my little bitty bio is that, yes, I was a Navy photographer for four years. Um, I was a camera, motion picture cameraman and still a photographer. And then um, a few years later, after trying to be a uh, freelance photographer in the Washington, D.C. area, I realized, like, ooh, I should go get a degree in this. And so I got a degree in something that is uh, nobody knows what it does. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine, uh, who was also a naval photographer, went through the same program I did, photographic science and instrumentation. He manufactured film. That's what you do with something like that kind of a degree. I became an imaging engineer in the semiconductor industry and eventually worked with high power microscopes in the uh, working in the uh, ultraviolet range. And so that's that's what you do with it. And if you didn't do those kinds of fun things, you went to work for the CIA because they use all kinds of to image, and a bunch of my classmates did. Um, so that's that's it. Um, you know, um, that, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you very much. I can you. Yeah. We're getting thumbs up on. Oh my God! Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Patrick. I have an announcement. It's a time to go ahead. Like, so come on up here and use my. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So site layman, membership coordinator, but also have taken the initiative to talk to the Spoonbillville Library about uh, coming up this year. And believe me, it's come quickly. Uh, we have a show scheduled February 16th to March 15th. And uh, knowing that uh, we had six photographers with the last one in October, I'm gonna encourage people to submit at least five uh, frame images and if you talk to me, you could probably have a few more. If you have framed ones you haven't shown for a while, uh, they have a very large unit to do with library. And I will be sending out the instructions uh, very quickly so that you can start thinking about printing up some new photographs, not just the one you have framed from last year or a few years or a hundred years ago. There is no, no jury on this. I don't think we'll have so many that you have to eliminate anybody. So if you're a member that has framed images, uh, that would be wonderful if you would think about February 16th, that would be the hanging day. And then um, we come back on March the 15th and take them down. And we appreciate your help in doing that. If you have any information, any contact uh, questions about how to do this, you can talk to me or Robert Rios, who's a member who has also helped with the shows. So please, please, please participate in this upcoming library show. It's early because, believe it or not, the Flutterville Library dates fill up very quickly and she didn't have any dates later. So I had to go for an earlier month. Okay. How many can they handle total? 
Beg how many images total can they handle? How many images total? Yeah. Uh, talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to, you know, depending on what kind of response we get from other people in the club, uh, that's a large room. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've had, um, we had 22 images at the last show, and we still had a lot more movement. Yeah. So I would, Easily. I would say he's, he's a really excellent photographer like you, Mark, could probably sit at 10 images very easily of you know, your frame to collect. Or again, you're making the smaller. Now, the other thing is for Bill and others who do really large prints, uh, it's possible that we could hang those in the, in the outer area, the hallway. Um, that's a, you've done that before. Right. Yeah. So uh, there should be plenty of room for everybody to participate for at least five images. Okay, thank you. Hey guys, this is Laszlo. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Just uh, we did join to the meeting uh, Zoom uh, and so Patrick's presentation. And then just, I would like to congratulate to him. And then he made an excellent job and then a uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Patrick? That was Laszlo thanking you for your wonderful presentation. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, thank Patrick and we'll call it. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, thank you to the attendants who came tonight. And please invite your friends and invite them to renew. We had about uh, 15 new uh, renewals, I would say, and we had several new members join as well. So, but we are shrinking, and I would like to. We have about 80, 84 members, something like that. 88 members active, but some of them are lifelong members. So, uh, we can certainly use a few more attending. I know it's dark outside, <laughs> but thank you all for attending the Zoom. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all for doing it through Zoom, too.